Would you like to hear a fishy story? Well, the crazy part about this one is that it's all true. Welcome to the world of the land-based game fishermen. It's a world of big fish, blue water and rugged coastlines. It's a dangerous and challenging world and one of sport fishing's last frontiers. At the start of each new summer on the east coast of Australia, the cold green currents of winter give way to the warm fingers of purple water. The tropical current slowly but surely begins its spiralling journey southbound from Queensland to the cooler waters of New South Wales and Victoria. And with it, all the majestic game fish of the Pacific arrive as soldiers in the night, bringing the best of both worlds to anglers in Australia's two most popular states. Most fishermen only dream about catching big fish from the rocks and revel in the articles written in fishing magazines. Hi, I'm Phil Atkinson. I'm a freelance fishing journalist and the type of fishing that I enjoy the most is chasing big game fish from the rocks. Over the last 12 months, some friends and I set out on a journey to catch the largest game fish that the East Coast rocks could throw at us. And by the end of it all, the sights we saw and the game fish we caught were absolutely mind-blowing. But I guess that's what land-based game fishing is all about. Early summer is big game fish time on the south coast of New South Wales and if anywhere could produce a really big fish for travelling companions Grantley Gray, John Key Hargis and myself, it was the deep waters of Jervis Bay, or JB as we affectionately call it. The area is rich in sport fishing tradition. It's the heartland of East Coast land-based game and in the 60s its honeycomb sandstone ledges were the birthing ground of Australian sport fishing. It's a ruggedly spectacular piece of coastline above the water, but it's the underwater landscape that really makes this place special. Protruding kilometres seaward and with water depths to 30 fathoms straight off the rocks, huge game fish and sharks daily pass along the base of these sea cliffs. If you want to catch big fish, you put out big baits. A two kilo bonito may not be every rock fisherman's idea of a bait, but not every rock fisherman wants to hook the size of fish we're chasing It was a three and a half hour marathon on 24 kilo tackle. I landed this 115 kilogram black marlin from a Jervis Bay rock ledge a few years ago using a whole tuna as bait. To think the world's largest land caught non shark game fish was hooked less than three metres from the shore. So much for casting out a long way to catch big fish. If you want to catch more fish and stay alive, a bit of time spent checking the sea and current conditions is definitely the way to go. So here we were, at the beginning of our trip and already looking at green cold water, which had a two metre southerly swell pushing through it. Good water for icebergs, not game fish. There was no way we were fishing that ledge tomorrow. No fish is worth risking your life for. The outer torpedo tubes on the more protected waters of Jervis Bay seem like a much better option. The tubes has a history as the world's number one land-based black marlin producer and there is a theory that the marlin come into the bay to rest and feed up out of the main body of coastal current on their trip south. Bucketing water is one of those jobs that we all hate, but we have to do it to keep the bait alive, particularly when we spent half the night trying to catch the bait. Johnny might have his bait in the water first, but mine was the first to go off. 
And when I'm at the tubes, until proven otherwise, I treat every hookup as a possible marlin. Every fish fights differently. You can't be sure what you've hooked until you see it, although it didn't take long to find out that all I had on was a small but mighty angry bronze whaler shark. Unawares to many, New South Wales rock anglers put a lot of fisheries tags into sharks and game fish each season. With recapture rates as little as 2 to 4%, if caught again, this little fellow is of great scientific value and I don't like his chances of being re-released. Now this is more like it. There's only one fish that can hit an angler with this sort of body punching and that's a big hoodlum kingfish. Our mate Dave Lovegrove doesn't like to pussyfoot around with light tackle from the stones. Just as well. Hoods like this one just laugh at the gear most rock fishermen throw at them. The power transfer on heavy tackle is incredible. Not just your arms, but your whole body feels the pain. One slip and this fish could pull Dave into the drink. And that's a place for fish, not fishermen. The shape and speed of a king makes it an incredibly difficult gaff shot under the best of conditions, let alone off the rocks. But Johnny does his job well. This unrehearsed teamwork between gaff man and angler was an unspoken bond we were to see many times before journey's end. <laughs> Even in defeat, the king still gets the last punch. A check on the lie detector is still no guarantee that a fish won't continue to grow. Depending on how fit you're feeling, one good fish on the rocks can mean the end of a top day. By the time Dave makes the 2k walk back to his truck with gear, fish and slime retarding plastic, he'll certainly know he's alive. But that's what game fishing the rocks is all about, getting out there and doing it. With the water temperature through the floor, it wasn't surprising to be greeted to the head shakes of a good sized Australian salmon. Around these parts, salmon are a sign of cold water and an unwelcome bait stealer when chasing bigger fish. Although, on light tackle, they are one of our premier sport fish. Our stay had been the calm before the storm, and as a large southerly front pushed in, the prospect of hanging around for the weather and current to improve was too much of a long shot. So we decided to leave the south coast and head north for hopefully bluer pastures. On our way up the coast, we stopped in to watch the erection of a guardian angel ring. These life buoys have been placed at popular rock spots along the New South Wales coastline. The New South Wales branch of the Australian Sport Fishing Association initiated and the state government has wisely invested in this life-saving project. Today, the anglers from Lake Macquarie Sport Fishing Club, many of them rock fishermen, are putting up this ring. Watching this almost solemn ceremony, my mind drifted back to a recent close call of my own, which really drove home the fact that the greatest safety device of all that rock fishermen have is between their ears. Putting it simply, if the seas are too big, then don't fish. Yeah, the guardian angel rings are a great idea. Um, I know of two people in the last week that have been saved because they, when they fell in, they were able to have a guardian angel ring thrown to them and they were rescued. They were able to stay in the water long enough for the helicopter to come along and actually rescue them. They're a great idea.
On the north coast, getting to some spots can be really tough going. A four-wheel drive may help, but a good pair of legs is still the only way you'll get close enough to the water to wet a line. One cast for five slimy mackerel isn't bad going in anyone's language, even if they are only bait. This many baits should see John through till lunchtime, which is just as well, as it'll take him that long to untangle the bait jig. Piccaninny sunrise is the coldest part of the day and the best time for bait gathering. And if the tuna move in, you'll need every single bait you can get your hands on. Overcast conditions can be really good for catching big game fish inshore. It may be that they feel less conspicuous in the shallower water. Talk about underdogs. Here we were, a dozen or so rock fishers preparing for the day ahead, still unsure of what fish the currents would drag past our small point. But little did we know that this was to be the beginning of some of the most incredible rock fishing we've experienced. The first hookup came as a double when Brendan Rolt and then Dave Brown found themselves trying to stop horizon bound tuna on light tackle. Both fish headed in opposite directions, which was just as well. If they'd stayed together, the shark that within minutes ate Dave's tuna would have made short work of Brendan's as well. On light tackle from the rocks, you've got to keep moving. You just can't expect to drag a big fish back to your feet. He's got a pretty loud fishing hat and a fishing style to match. He knows that time in the water is crucial as the big body will already be looking for dessert. But half an hour later, a couple of sharp bumps are transmitted through the line, everything feels a lot lighter, and he knows it's all but over. All that's left to do now is rescue what's left of his tuna. Your local barber would probably call this a number one cut, short back and sides. The fish was a northern bluefin tuna and that's one bite. Not from your little surface cruising hammerhead or whaler shark that surf beaches are evacuated for. And in the days to come we could have shot a land based sequel to Jaws, only without the plastic sharks. A movie experience that would have made one north coast tourist council very nervous I'm sure. By dragging fish like this back to the rocks, we'd unintentionally opened a window through which to see just how big the sharks are that often lurk inshore for an easy meal. The way things were shaping up, this little fellow knew where the safest place to be was. The next hookup was a really big fish with plenty of low down grunt. It wasn't behaving like a tuna, instead doing all its fighting deep and in close. Predictions range from shark, jewfish to cobia. Someone even called it for an electric charge num ray, but I think that was just to unsettle the gaff man. Whatever it was, it was giving Grant Kime and his 10 kilo spinning outfit a real going over.
When colour came, we weren't surprised to hear the gaff man call it for a big cobia. Grant had never caught a cobia, and the thought of such an excellent first time capture made him go a bit wobbly at the knees. Just check out the situation the gaff man has to deal with. A five metre drop, tonnes of falling white water, and a cobia that true to its heritage just won't give in. But with a great gaff shot to the jaw, everything came together in the biggest possible way. Not a bad first time cobia from the rocks. I think he'll be telling stories about this fish for many years to come. The landing of this cobia marked the beginning of what many believe to be the best New South Wales land-based cobia bite in living memory, and we were right in the middle of it. As I watched a boatload of divers sussing out the water conditions, after what I'd seen earlier, I breathed a bit easy when they decided to go for a dip elsewhere. When the next hookup came my way, I wasn't in the mood for playing light tackle sport fisherman. The way these waters were fishing, you didn't know what you were going to hook next. Rock fishing is so unpredictable. There's no end to the variety of fish and fishermen that are lured by the call of the rocks. Two rock fishermen can be standing shoulder to shoulder, both staring at a small red float bobbing in the wash, one fishing for rock blackfish, the other for black marlin. It's at the gaff when most fish are lost, and one great advantage of heavier tackle is that you can really control the fish when it counts most. The size of a cobia's mouth is amazing. In a previous life, this fish could have been a football commentator. Their eating habits are just as wide ranging, and by the bend in these rods, I'd say slimies were the fish of the day on the cobia's menu. To do their fighting, 
these fish went for the two-man game, and for a while lines of contact were dangerously close to crossing. In fishing terms, this is called getting smoked. And on six kilo line, there's not a lot you can do except hold on and pray the fish stops. Just when Brendan felt he had it all under control, a wave lifted, then dropped, and it was all over. I don't think it was meant to be Brendan's day. All he can do now is lend moral support to Brownie, who's still working hard. Impatience can be the undoing of the light tackle game fisherman. And I'm sure at times you felt like screwing up the drag and sculling this fish in. But that's how you break your line, not records. In fishing terms, dreams can come true. And they have for Brownie as the boys drag a new Australian sport fishing record cobia up onto the rocks. No sooner had we settled down from the cobia chaos than Dave Lovegrove was up to his old tricks again, doing his best to get pulled in on heavy tackle. Just how close did Dave come to getting dragged in? None of us have seen a fish of this size change direction as quickly as this one did. And for a while it was absolute chaos as Dave struggled to stay on his feet and we struggled to get a rod bucket on him and clear the other lines.
Dave never really looked like getting this fish. Even on 24 kilos, some fish are just unstoppable. When the end did come, the fish was just starting to realise it had been hooked. Maybe if Dave starts using lighter tackle, he might start hooking small fish like the rest of us.